I'm Margaret Mantor, and I work for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife in our Habitat Conservation Planning Branch. Uh, today's lecture is part of the Conservation Lecture Series. You can see our upcoming lectures and register to get notified when we plan new lectures. You can also watch videos of past lectures all on our website. Uh, we have one lecture schedule that's going to be coming up in July on um, fire plant diversity and succession. And that one was organized by Sherilyn Burton. So she's been organizing a nice little section of plant talks for us. Um, today's talk has actually been organized by Justin Garcia, who is in our wildlife branch. So thank you for organizing today's lecture. Uh, we're going to have a joint presentation by Samantha Markham and Serena Jepson. Samantha oversees the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's coastal program in the Pacific Southwest, and she coordinates with partners on monarch butterfly conservation efforts throughout the western United States. She participates on a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service national team to facilitate monarch conservation planning and implementation. And she's working with groups across California and Nevada to identify and address data gaps for monarchs to conduct overwintering site conservation activities and to support monarch tagging and research projects. She's worked for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service since 2003 on endangered species, bat acoustics, habitat restoration on private lands, and coastal research, restoration, and acquisition projects. And Serena directs the Xerxes Society uh, Endangered Species Program, where she works on the conservation of monarch butterflies, bumblebees, freshwater mussels, and other at-risk invertebrate species. Since 2007, she developed, implemented, and overseen uh, numerous projects that address the conservation of monarch butterflies in natal, migratory, and overwintering habitats of the Western United States. She's co-authored many publications about monarch butterflies, including the report Conservation Status and Ecology of the Monarch Butterfly in the United States, and the book chapter Understanding and Conserving the Western North American Monarch Population. She serves as deputy chair of the IUCN Bumblebee Specialist Group, where she works with bumblebee experts to evaluate the conservation status of bumblebees around the world. So we're very lucky to have both of you here today. Thank you. Hello, I'm Samantha Markham, and so I'm going to go ahead and kick off the talk today. And we're going to first just describe a little bit about our various efforts with monarch butterfly conservation. So I'll walk through a little bit about what the Fish and Wildlife Service is doing and the genesis of that, and then I'll hand it over to Serena before we get started on the bulk of the talk. So in 2014, there was a presidential memo that came out highlighting the importance of pollinators and calling upon all federal agencies to prioritize pollinator conservation. And, and in that, monarchs were identified as somewhat of a flagship species. And then also in that same year, the ESA petition was put forward to the Fish and Wildlife Service to consider listing the monarch butterfly as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. And I'll talk just a little bit more, more about that later also in that same year. So really, most things got started just about a year and a half ago for the Fish and Wildlife Service. The director of the Fish and Wildlife Service sent out a memo to all Fish and Wildlife Service employees saying that the monarch butterfly is a priority for conservation. Pollinators are a priority as well. But monarchs are a great pollinator that we can use for outreach to engage others in wanting to conserve pollinators in general. So in 2015, the Fish and Wildlife Service, along with other, other federal agencies and other partners, put together a national strategy to promote the health of honeybees and other pollinators. And that is intended to become part of an international strategy as well for conservation. And also in 2015, the Monarch Initiative was more formalized through the Fish and Wildlife Service. And our director committed $4 million per year towards monarchs specifically over a five-year period, and we're in the, the second year of that. And so right now, we're working on a national framework within Fish and Wildlife Service of how we're 
going to continue to conduct conservation efforts, fill in research gaps, and identify where we go into the future. And so I, I want to point out that the service and the Xerces Society are working really closely on a lot of these things, and that's at multiple levels. That's on the international level, um, across regions of the Fish and Wildlife Service, states, and down to local scales of individual projects. And so the basic pillars for the Monarch Conservation Strategy for the service is providing leadership, so that's across federal agencies but in other realms as well, and as participating in the trilateral committee, so that's with the United States, Canada, and Mexico, and the Xerces Society is part of that as well, and there's actually a meeting, the annual meeting next week in Canada for the trilateral. And also, Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, and we um, gave a presentation last year to the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies with um, Karen Miner also attended for that WAFWA meeting last year to just call attention to other states about the importance of monarch conservation and pollinator conservation in general. We also work with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and 1.2 million per year of that 4 million that I just mentioned that's coming from Fish and Wildlife Service, 1.2 million of that goes into a National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant where money is disseminated across the United States to promote monarch conservation. We also have a focus on enhancement and restoration of habitat and that 200,000 acres that's identified was primarily in the east for monarchs. We work closely with NRCS and in the science realm with US Geological Survey and the Powell Center, again, mostly Eastern focused for that. And we do have um, some folks within Fish and Wildlife Service that are working on national strategies for inventory and monitoring of monarchs. And then the people are, of course, very important and at the root of all of this. And so we have a lot of people that are working on communication strategies and outreach strategies to the public within the Fish and Wildlife Service. And our schoolyard habitat program plays a central role in that in reaching out to schools and developing pollinator gardens and helping people in court or coordinate um, pollinator conservation and monarch conservation into the curriculum of the students. So I'll hand it over to Serena. Thanks. Um, so I'm Serena Jepson. I direct our endangered species and aquatic programs at the Xerces Society, and we are a nonprofit conservation organization that works to protect invertebrate species and their habitats. Um, we've been around since the 1970s and um, began initially as a scientific society of, of people who study butterflies um, and named after the now extinct Xerces blue butterfly, which is the first butterfly that went extinct as a result of, of human activity and it, it used to live in the Presidio area of San Francisco. Um, we now work more broadly on a wide variety of species beyond butterflies, but maintain sort of strong roots in butterfly conservation. And really, we have been working on monarch butterfly conservation for decades. In the early 1990s, our founder, Robert Michael Pyle, worked with Lincoln Brower and the IUCN to declare the monarch migration as a threatened phenomena. Um, in 1993, so that was before we really had seen the declines that we've seen at this point. Um, we're a small staff headquartered in Portland, but with offices in, in California, the Midwest, the, the Northeast, and the, the Eastern Seaboard. Um, our staff are primarily scientists. We're restoration ecologists, entomologists, conservation biologists. Um, and we do have a number of, of individuals who are working wholly on monarch butterfly conservation right now. Our approach to conservation is multifaceted. We do a lot of conservation planning work uh, with public land managers as well as private farmers and, and other individuals. We do research. Um, a lot of our research is applied in nature, um, but we are scientists and we do conduct research. We also engage citizen scientists. We use a, a crowdsourcing approach quite frequently to answer questions critical to conservation. Um, we do a lot of education provide a lot of coursework and develop a lot of publications to um, educate individuals about uh, issues of conservation importance. We do restoration work, and then lastly, we engage in policy. So now I'm going to switch back to Samantha, who will give you an overview and go into life history. <laughs> 
Hey, so these are the main topics of the talk today. We're going to talk about life history of monarchs, the conservation status, potential threats, our priority research and conservation efforts, opportunities for conservation, and we've geared some of that specifically for California because of the primary audience today, and resources and tools that are available for many people to use for monarch conservation, and then open it up to questions. So a brief overview of life history. The subspecies Danaeus plexibus plexibus, the monarch butterfly, has a worldwide distribution. But for the purposes of the talk and for the purposes of, of monarch conservation in general for the US, Canada, and Mexico, we're focusing on the North American distribution. So for Eastern and Western monarchs in North America, they have the same genetic makeup. And there is a lot more that's known about the Eastern population. And we will highlight some things that we do know about the Western population or evidence to support certain things, but we will walk through some of that. The breeding locations in particular that are important, we don't really know for the Western population. So this is a basic map of monarch migration. And so if we start in the winter, the primary concentrations of monarchs would be at an area in Mexico and then dispersed along the California coast at multiple groves because they're roosting in trees within the winter. And so they're typically at their overwintering sites from fall, September, October until February or March when they leave the overwintering sites and begin a multi-generational migration. And so the ones that are in Mexico, there may be some coming up into the West, but then the bulk of them are going up into the Eastern United States. And across multiple generations, as I mentioned, they disperse across the eastern United States. And in the west, they're fanning out from those overwintering sites in multiple directions to areas, again, we're not exactly sure um, all of the areas where they are breeding across the west. And so that's across the spring and summer until it comes back to the fall, where then the butterflies make their way back to the overwintering grounds and start the cycle all over again. There is also a non-migratory population that's on the tip of Florida. So for the West, where we aren't certain how many generations actually encompass that migratory phenomenon, but three to four is the current best guess. We do know that adults need nectar sources year round for migratory fuel, as well as for overwintering fuel and hydration. But for, for breeding, where the monarchs lay their eggs and for the caterpillar's food source, they need milkweed. And in the Western United States, there are a lot of different species of milkweed, and so there are about 35 species that we know of. And for an individual butterfly, just walking through the timeline, it takes about a month to go through the full metamorphosis to become an adult butterfly from egg, larva, and pupa. And then the adult butterfly, depending on the generation associated with the time of year, um, there's a different lifespan for those adult butterflies from one to nine months, nine months being a long time. So as far as migration, this may be a little bit difficult to see within the audience, but from a paper with Dingle et al. in 2005, the, based on the records at that time, the distribution was associated with rivers, which was consistent with anecdotal accounts. And then here's another way to look at it, where it shows the different months of the year. And again, this is focused on the West. And these are our individual records, these points on the map, where you can see that in January, February, as well as in November and December, most of the records are concentrated in the coastal area, whereas across the spring and summer, they're, di they're dispersed across the west. And this figure is representative of where some monarch tagging efforts have occurred in Arizona, and I believe this is with Gail Morris's work with the Southwest Monarch Study. There is evidence of the Western monarchs migrating down to spend the winter, most likely in Mexico. And that's 
some newer information. And then also, there is some indications of, of tag, tagged monarchs from even the more northerly states that they are dispersing south, and they may also be headed to Mexico in the winter. So we're not certain about what portion of the population or if we're not certain about which of the Western monarchs are spending the overwintering in California versus Mexico. We aren't certain of the proportion, I should say. But we do know that each winter there is a concentration along the forested groves on the California coast. And and only approximately 20 of those sites, and I believe there's about 450-ish historic overwintering sites, only about 20 of those host over 1,000 monarchs at this time. So a little bit reiteration, the adult monarchs arrive at the overwintering sites September, October, and then they spend the winter there in these tree groves and are in reproductive diapause for the most part, with only a few exceptions. And they are often roosting in eucalyptus trees. However, they also use Monterey cypress, um, Monterey pine, and other native trees. And with a recent study that was conducted by Griffiths and Villablanca, they demonstrated that there was not a preference for eucalyptus trees over native trees, which was some people previously hypothesized. So it's somewhat complicated, it seems, as far as the requirements of the overwintering sites in order to be suitable for monarchs. And there's a lot of research that still needs to happen there. So there are these microclimatic requirements, such as protection from wind and storms, shelter from freezing temperatures, light conditions, high humidity, course, access to sources of water and to nectar sources. And so the next section is the conservation status of monarchs. And I'll just kick it off talking a little bit about the ESA process. And then I'm going to hand it over to Serena again. So for where we're at in the Endangered Species Act process and a little bit about the history relative to monarchs, as I mentioned before, the service was petitioned to list the monarch as threatened with critical habitat and a recommended 4D special rule. And that was in August of 2014. And so the main entities or the entities that were signed on to that petition was the Center for Food Safety, the Center for Biological Diversity, the Xerces Society, and Dr. Lincoln Brower. And so I just wanted to highlight here um, that it's somewhat of an unusual relationship um, with the Xerces Society and the Fish and Wildlife Service, but it's a very positive relationship because the Xerces Society has been very engaged in actively trying to address the conservation needs of the species and in working with the Fish and Wildlife Service and other federal agencies, and as I mentioned before, at many different scales. So they're very engaged in the process of conservation, as well as sharing just the years and years of information that they have within their nonprofit group. So then in December of 2014, the service issued a 90-day finding that the listing may be warranted. So then that starts this whole other process that is called the 12-month finding. And by January of 2016, the service still had not um, issued the 12-month finding. So there was a notice in of intent to sue again, this time for failure to meet that 12-month finding deadline. And this time it was Center for um, Food Safety and Center for Biological Diversity. And so just this year and really this month, it's it's the species status assessment part of things is starting. And that so that's looking at... Um, the, the current status of the species, ongoing conservation efforts just based on best available scientific information in order to make that decision about whether the species ultimately will or will not be listed. So the 12-month finding will be based on the species status assessment. And if the finding of that is that listing is warranted, then there will be a final listing review that's made with when, within one year of that proposed listing. So it's 
somewhat of a complicated process, but we're in the midst of it right now. Uh oh, Serena. Okay. Um, so just to take a step back, um, we estimate the size of monarch populations in two places every year, and that's where they congregate for the winter. So um, in Mexico, uh, uh, many individuals, including World Wildlife Fund and the Mexican government, um, measure the area occupied by monarchs in the, the mountains in central Mexico. Um, and in California, a team of volunteers, um, led by actually the Xerces Society, through the Western Monarch Thanksgiving count, um, actually count the number of monarchs in these forested groves on the California coast. Um, the populations that overwinter in Mexico are orders of magnitude larger than those that we have in California. Not to say that California is not important. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, um, in Mexico, historic highs reached about 675 million monarchs in the, the mid-1990s. And this last year, we had about 150 million monarchs estimated in Mexico, um, with a recent low of only 25 million there. In California, since monitoring began in the late 1990s, we have only measured at most 1 million monarchs in, at California overwintering sites. And this last year, um, our population estimate was at about 270,000. Um, <clears> this is, this graph is from the data from the monarchs measured in Mexico, and uh, analyses of the long-term population trends at these sites show a significant annual decline of about 9% per year over the last 22 years. Um, the low in the winter of 2013-2014 represented just about 10% of the long-term average. Um, so that's where you might hear people have said that, that there's been a 90% decline in, in monarchs. Of course, insect populations fluctuate from year to year, so there are uh, different ways you can measure this. Um, but, but in addition to that, the USGS recently did a um, population viability analysis and concluded that there's substantial probability of quasi-extinction, so having the monarch population be reduced to just a few hundred thousand individuals over the next 20 years, not that that's a paper by Simmons at all. Um, and, and I think this, the population, the monarch population, both in Mexico and in California, is extremely vulnerable to extreme weather events. So um, this year, we had about 150 million monarchs estimated at overwintering sites in Mexico. But in March, there was this sort of unusual late winter storm that dropped a lot of snow on the overwintering sites before all the monarchs had, had left to migrate north again. Um, and uh, the mortality is still unknown from that event, but some estimates have, have put it at, you know, around 30% mortality. Um, and, and similarly, in the early 2000s, there was a, um, an event where, a mortality event where um, literally hundreds of millions of monarchs were killed when there was a winter storm at the overwintering sites. So the fact that they congregate in such a small area um, really is at the heart of why a species that's so numerous can be even considered for um, protection as an endangered or a threatened species under the ESA. Um, in the western U.S., our population trend is, is similar to that in the east. Um, this, the data I sh I'm showing here is from the Western Monarch Thanksgiving count, where citizen scientists have been estimating monarch populations at California overwintering sites since 1997. Um, and again, we have a, a significant long-term decline. Um, a lot of people who have uh, seen the Thanksgiving count data comment upon how high the 1997 count was, and it, it appears to be an anomaly. And so um, to address this and to really try to understand if 1997 was just this odd year, we did look at a few individual overwintering sites in California for which we had um, population estimates or site estimates prior to 1997. And, and we found that at three out of the four overwintering sites for which we had information on population size prior to 1997, 1997 was not actually the highest year. Um, at Elwood, Maine, for example, on the, the top left of the screen, um, we had you know, an estimate of uh, 120,000 monarchs at that one site in 1981. And in 1997, there were only about 20, 20 25,000 monarchs estimated there. Um, so we don't think 1997 was this anomalous year, even though that's just that's the first year that our um, more rigorous uh, 
monitoring effort began. Um, if, we, if we pool estimates from monarch overwintering sites and look at the average number per site over a five-year period at the beginning of the Thanksgiving counts, so from 1997 to 2001, and compare that to more recent, a more recent pooled estimate, we see a 74% decline in California overwintering monarchs. And um, that's really consistent with the decline seen in, um, at Mexican overwintering sites. We have very little information about where monarchs breed in the Western US, let alone how their populations are doing at breeding sites. But we do have this one really neat um, piece of research out of the University of Nevada, Reno, Matt Forrester's lab by Espeset et al, where um, these individuals looked at data collected over 40 years by Dr. Art Shapiro from UC Davis. And they analyzed summer flight records along this transect, um, and this figures from their paper, the transect is, um, uh, the points along the transect are numbered on the map, so the A, B, C, D, um, or sorry, they have, are indicated by letters. And basically they found really negative trends at California breeding sites in monarch populations, um, comparable to or possibly even greater than trends observed in the eastern US. They also found that the declines are concentrated early in the breeding season, and they suggested that um, shifting climatic conditions and milkweed loss may not actually be the most important factors driving monarch declines, um, but that insecticide use and um, overwintering habitat loss are factors that also should be investigated as, as potential threats. Um, and then lastly, Xerces recently worked with NatureServe in partnership with the US Forest Service to do a conservation status and extinction risk assessment of monarch butterflies uh, in North America. Um, so overall, we, well, we use their standardized method to evaluate extinction risk using range extent, population trends, threats, vulnerability, and a, a variety of other factors. Um, and using their rank calculator found the uh, subspecies Danaeus plexippus plexippus to be vulnerable to extinction, the California overwintering population to be um, imperiled or vulnerable, and the Mexican overwintering population to be critically imperiled. Um, and again, the, the Primary threat factor is just the fact that these animals are concentrated in such a small area um, at such high concentrations during this, this part of their life stage. OK, and now we're going to switch to discuss potential threats to monarchs. And Samantha will come back up to give that part. So as we both keep saying, there's a lot that we don't know about Western monarchs, including what really are the threats. So that's why this is labeled as potential threats. So for many species, including monarchs, development is a threat, loss of habitat, also agricultural conversion of lands. We do know that there's loss and alteration to overwintering habitat, and I'll discuss that just a little bit more on some slides coming up. But also the breeding and the migratory habitat may be declining. However, we don't have enough information at this time to clearly state that, th that milkweed would be a limiting factor for Western monarchs. It's considered by many people to be a limiting factor in the East for monarchs. Also, chemical application, herbicides and insecticides, and in particular, glyphosate, which is very common, particularly in the Central Valley of California, may be a factor, as well as neonicotinoids. Drought and climate change may also be factors, and disease. And so I'll talk a little bit about the threats, and then we will get into how we're trying to fill in some of this missing information and do some proactive conservation. So overwintering habitat loss, at least 30 sites have been logged for housing developments or no longer support monarchs. So there we do know that we have lost some of the historic overwintering sites. And then 32 sites have become unsuitable for monarchs, either due to diseased trees or habitat alterations. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, there are these micro habitat conditions that we believe are important. So even if a site isn't being directly impacted, but areas around a site are impacted, it could potentially have negative results for monarchs that are overwintering there. So systemic insecticides, as the title 
states there's a systemic mode of action with these and so that affects all parts of the plant including the leaf tissue and the nectar and it's persistent for long periods of time in plants, soil, and in water. And as just an example of another insect that we know has been impacted that there was a kill, a kill of I think it was 50,000 bees, is that right? In Portland, Oregon, I believe Serena witnessed that. And so that's what this photo is representing. And that was a legal application of a insecticide and it was highly toxic to bees. And as far as natural enemies, the impacts are poorly understood for monarchs, but the parasite OE, Ophrocytus electris if I'm pronouncing that correctly, I usually just say OE. Um, it is the most well studied of monarch natural enemies, and severe infestations of OE can slow development, cripple adults, and reproduce reproductive fitness. And so, this is this photo here is showing a monarch that is impacted by that. We do need more information on OE as well, and there are folks along the California coast that are working to gather more information. Tropical milkweed is associated with OE and due to its evergreen nature. It can affect winter breeding monarchs. And so tropical milkweed is not native to California and we do not um, want folks to be planting tropical milkweed. But in some cases, there, there are some tropical milkweed that are still in place. The winter breeding monarch populations on the Gulf Coast from studies that were done there, they were five times more likely to be infected with OE than migratory monarchs. And the impact of winter breeding and tropical milkweed in the western U.S., as I mentioned, is currently being investigated further by monarch health and collaborators. So now we're going to talk about some priority research and conservation efforts, and I'm going to hand it back over to Serena. Okay, um, so I'll talk about work that the Xerces Society is doing, much of which is in partnership with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or with funding from Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as in partnership with other um, state and federal agencies and, and other partners. Um, I'm going to talk about um, applied research and citizen science to inform habitat management in natal and migratory habitat some of our work to develop technical guidance to inform habitat management, and some of our habitat enhancement work all within the natal and migratory region of the monarchs, monarch butterfly. Um, and then I'll also discuss some of our work in overwintering habitat through citizen science and also some of the, the technical guidance and conservation planning work we do to inform overwintering habitat management. Um, so as Samantha's mentioned, we don't really know in the West what the most important natal sites are for monarchs, where, where monarchs are born, what habitat they're using out here, nor do we really understand their migratory pathways. Um, there have been a few previous studies that have revealed some sort of general regional patterns of monarch natal origins, where monarchs are produced. Um, on the left, we have a great study by Louis Yang's lab and his collaborators that was just published last year using stable isotopes. Um, to identify uh, where monarchs collected overwintering sites were born, roughly, in the western U.S. Um, and the surprise from this study is that many of them came from the yellow area, from Idaho and Montana. Um, and it, So this is measuring the last generation of monarchs at overwintering sites. Um, but still, these are sort of broad brush approaches to finding out where monarchs are breeding. We don't we don't know exactly where they're breeding. Um, and this other study by Stevens and Fry, published in 2010, used a, a modeling approach um, looking at climatic factors and um, availability of milkweed during the right season and uh, the areas of the west that are shaded in gray suggest some um, likely, some areas that are likely important for monarch production in the west. Um, but to build upon that work um, and to really try to find out more specifically where monarchs are breeding, um, the Xerces Society really started in 2013 with a, a crowdsourcing approach to answer this question. And we basically asked our network of individuals um, 
monarch enthusiasts, native plant enthusiasts, land managers, agency staff, um, lepidopterists to tell us where milkweed occurred. So we reached out to folks across the West through a milkweed survey um, and said, hey, tell us if you know where milkweed is and send us pictures. Tell us if you know where, if you have any documentation of like monarch caterpillars on milkweed or, or someone actually using, um, monarchs actually using a milkweed stand so that we could start to drill down on, on specifically what areas might be important in the West that we should, so that we can start thinking about, you know, how do we conserve those, those habitats? Um, last year, this effort um, moved into a really strong collaboration with the Fish and Wildlife Service. And so through our milkweed survey, we were able to build a database of about 8,000 records of milkweed and monarch breeding. Um, and with collaborating with Fish and Wildlife Service, we've now expanded it to about 28,000 records and really filled in this map in the Western US of, of where milkweed occurs. Um, and what areas monarchs are using. So we began this Western Monarch and Milkweed Habitat Suitability Assessment, which involved building a database and doing um, species distribution models for both milkweed and monarchs. Um, so we recognized that, that climatic variability, geographic features, as well as milkweed availability all likely influence the distribution of monarch habitat in the landscape. Um, and yet milkweed and monarch data in the West has been really limited. So recognizing the need to identify the highest priority monarch breeding areas so that we could inform areas possibly for restoration or active management and also identify areas that we maybe need to look more closely at. Um, so for those reasons, we um, worked with the Fish and Wildlife Service to employ a species distribution modeling approach to quantify these relationships and to prioritize key landscapes. And this project is actually led by Joe Ingler, who's in Region 1 of the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so the main objectives of this habitat suitability assessment were to consolidate existing milkweed and monarch records from both the Xerces database as well as other sources, to collect new data primarily on refuges um, for milkweed and monarchs, and then to compile some geospatial data layers um, that we thought might influence milkweed and monarch distribution. Uh, so through this project, we, as I mentioned, have, have built this database of 28,000 monarch or milkweed and monarch breeding records in 11 western states. And then we've used MaxInt, and this is primarily done by Madeline Steele on this project. We used the MaxInt software to model the um, relative habitat suitability for a number of western species of milkweed, and I'm just going to show you a couple of them, but these are the preliminary results of the model. Um, this is showy milkweed, which is broadly distributed across the western US, um, commonly found in California as well as Pacific Northwest states. Um, and it's the species for which we had the best data, the, high, the most accurate data, and, and just the most data. Um, so the areas that are bluer on this map indicate a higher relative habitat suitability for this species of milkweed. Um, we also, here's also an example of another species of milkweed that's more southwesterly, um, is spider milkweed. It, it occurs in the, in the desert southwest. Um, and again, the, the blue areas indicate the higher relative habitat suitability. And we did this for a number of other milkweed species, and then we fed all of the milkweed species models into a monarch breeding model. Um, and this is the preliminary result of the um, relative habitat suitability for monarch breeding. Um, so we had about 550 monarch breeding records. Um, but I, I do want to caution interpretation of this map in that we had very little data from the uh, Intermountain West and Rocky Mountain West states to, um, so we can't really draw conclusions about the, the relative importance of habitat in those states. Um, we did project this model across some large unsampled areas, uh, including Nevada and Utah, um, at this output. But this is really the first iteration of this model, and we recognize that major data gaps remain in both the Intermountain West and the Rocky Mountain West, which really limit the ability for us to understand which areas are important for monarchs um, in those parts of the West. So this summer, the Xerces Society, in partnership with Fish and Wildlife Service, um, as well as many Fish and Wildlife Service staff and other partners, are going to be collecting data in those states. And if there's anybody um, on this webinar or, or even in this audience um, uh, 
who is interested in contributing data to this model, please do. We would love to take your information, incorporate it into the database, and to continue to use that information to better understand um, which areas of the West are most important for monarchs. And, and you can go to this, the website on the screen here to um, find the, the tool to, that best suits you for contributing data to this model. And we also have a project that's funded by a state wildlife grant from the Fish and Wildlife Service um, in partnership with Idaho Department of Fish and Game and Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife called Integrating Strategic Conservation Approaches into the State Wildlife Action Plans for Idaho and Washington. And it's focused on monarch butterflies. Um, it's essentially taking this milkweed database and putting it online so that people can... Um, really easily access the information um, as well as upload information. We're also collecting additional historical data on monarchs and milkweeds and current data in those two states um, as well as providing some, some education to land managers and citizen scientists in both Idaho and Washington. Um, we also have a project that's um, focused on the Great Basin and on habitat management for monarchs within the Great Basin. So this summer, um, the Xerces Society, in partnership with Fish and Wildlife Service, Forest Service, BLM, and Matt Forrester, who's a professor at University of Nav Nevada, Reno, um, will be out throughout the Great Basin conducting milkweed and monarch breeding surveys. I mean, we'll also be interviewing land managers throughout western states to, in order to better understand how land management practices affect monarch habitat. And there's a special focus of this project on rangelands because... Um, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that people are um, that people are actively eradicating milkweed when it occurs on rangelands because of its actual toxicity or perceived toxicity to livestock. Um, so we're really trying to better understand what the issues are around livestock grazing, especially given that so much land in the western U.S. is um, rangeland. Um, so we're trying to better understand where there are conflicts, if there are conflicts, and if there are opportunities to, to work around those conflicts. Um, so as part of this project, we'll be developing a set of best management practices in 2017 that will um, guide habitat management for milkweed and monarchs on public lands throughout the West, um, and, as well as providing some, some short courses as part of this project. Um, and just to, to reiterate, about half of our land base in the western U.S. Uh, is federally managed. So there's a, a real a major opportunity um, to conserve monarch habitat in these areas. I think that's consistent in the state of California. Um, and it's certainly in other states that are important to monarchs like Nevada, we've got you know, upwards of 80% of their land um, federally managed. So... Um, there's a real role for federal agencies to play in monarch habitat conservation. Um, we're also developing some technical guidance for land managers and restoration practitioners. Um, we've got about 15 regional monarch nectar plant lists in development of, of native nectar plants, recognizing that monarchs not only need milkweed for their caterpillars to uh, grow up, um, but they also need nectar to fuel their migration. So we're, we're developing lists for um, two lists for California, as well as for other regions of the country of nectar plants that are attractive to monarchs, native, commercially available, um, hardy, uh, you know, available to establish in restoration, um, and in bloom during the right time of the year. Um, we also have a, a, an effort in partnership with the NRCS and multiple seed producers um, to develop locally native sources of milkweed seed. So recognizing that, especially in the eastern U.S., but across the U.S., really, there's a call to restore like a million and a half acres a year of milkweed and nectar plants. And yet, in many regions of the U.S., um, we don't really have an appropriate local seed source. Um, so we launched a project a few years ago called Project Milkweed um, to develop locally appropriate sources of native milkweed seed, both for for large-scale restoration practitioners, land managers, farmers um, who are planting hedgerows, but also um, also for your gardener to just make um, to just bring into production some of these locally appropriate sources of seed. So one of our focal states was California, and we worked with our partners at Hedgerow Farms outside of outside of Davis, California, um, on this project. 
And um, through the project, we've developed some seed production guidelines and um, brought 11 locally appropriate milkweed species um, into production so far. Um, and we've developed a national directory of milkweed seed vendors called the Milkweed Seed Finder to help folks who want to plant local native seed find um, suppliers. So really to connect the, the consumer with the um, distributor for local native milkweed seed. Um, and then through our pollinator um, conservation work and in partnership with the NRCS and private landowners, we restore a lot of habitat next to farms. And so um, in this work, we have been incorporating native milkweed in tens of thousands of acres of hedgerow habitat. And I, I just wanted to show a few pictures from some of our California projects. I hope you could pick out the milkweed in that, in that habitat picture. But... Um, Milkweed is such an important plant for so many other species of pollinators and beneficial insects that it's really, there are many reasons beyond just providing the host plant for monarch butterflies to include milkweed in, in conservation plantings. Um, here's a picture of, of one of our projects um, next to an almond orchard in Arbuckle, California. And it has milkweed right in the foreground. Um, and here's another picture of, of one of our plantings at a Muir Glen um, tomato production facility in Northern California. And you can see showy milkweed is uh, established here in the foreground. Okay, and then I'll switch and just speak briefly about some of our conservation efforts in overwintering habitats. And then it'll go back to Samantha. Um, so as Samantha mentioned previously, we have this incredible phenomena in California, California being the only state in the nation really where we have significant overwintering monarch butterflies. And also we have their other life stages. So California is really the only place where someone can see monarchs um, every season of the year and sort of throughout their, their life cycle. Um, monarchs cluster in, in really hundreds of coastal California groves. Uh, currently, we have some sites that have more than 20,000 monarchs. Historically, we had some sites that had more than 100,000. But there's really only a few sites that routinely have more than 1,000 monarchs. Um, through the Western Monarch Thanksgiving Count, there's this incredible effort, more, more than 100 volunteers every year, going out and actually counting all of these monarchs um, around the Thanksgiving holiday. So it happens for three weeks around the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, everyone uses a standardized method so that we can compare our counts. And from this effort, um, we have an index of the Western population. Now, as Samantha mentioned, because we don't know how many monarchs in the West are going to California versus Mexico, we can't say that this is representative of the entire Western population, but it is an, it is an index. It is a measure of um, how monarchs in California are doing. And because of this effort of the Western Monarch Thanksgiving Count volunteers, um, we know that monarchs are declining in California. Without this work, we would really have no idea um, how their populations were doing. Um, we've also worked over the years pretty extensively with the California Natural Diversity Database, um, who compiled the first um, database of California overwintering monarch locations. And that was a database built upon work by um, Walt Sakai and, and many others who um, documented the locations of these overwintering sites. So quite a few years ago, we worked with the CNDDB and combined all of our population estimates at overwintering sites from the Western Monarch Thanksgiving Count with their database um, and have added in habitat assessments from overwintering sites. So we um, combined all of this information to build a more comprehensive database that has um, current population estimates for overwintering sites so that when um, someone calls the Xerces Society, for example, and says, hey, there's a, a development happening at this place that has monarchs. What do you know about it? What can you do? We can really easily find out how important of a site is it? Was it historically used by monarchs? And to what extent does it fall within the coastal zone? Um, and, you know, be better understand um, kind of what's happening with overwintering sites. <clears throat> so we've been working with the Fish and Wildlife Service most recently with this database um, to rank the highest priority monarch overwintering sites to try to understand, you know, recognizing that resources are limited, um, 
which sites should be prioritized for active management and restoration. And so we've looked at um, the degree of decline at each of these overwintering sites since we, since we have that information and also how much of the remaining overwintering, how much of the total population is represented at this particular overwintering site. So those are sort of the two factors that will make a site high priority. Um, we, we wanted to use the level of threat as a, a factor to rank overwintering sites, but we really didn't, don't have consistent data um, from across all the overwintering sites to use that as a, a, a factor. Um, so here are just the top 10 highest priority overwintering sites um, that we're recommending for restoration and active management. Um, Pismo Beach being the highest priority with currently hosting, um, well, average over the last, over a recent five-year period, it had about 25,000 monarchs um, and has declined by nearly 65% um, from the late 1990s. Um, so we're, this is a part of a state of the overwintering sites report that, that will be made publicly available very soon. Um, but I thought I would provide a, a preview of that report. And then we're, we're working in partnership with the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, a nonprofit called Groundswell, as well as Lighthouse Field State Park and Ardenwood Historic Farm to develop site management plans for two high priority overwintering sites. And those are Lighthouse Field and Ardenwood. Um, and then Lastly, we've got some overwintering site management guidelines um, that are um, general guidelines and considerations for managing overwintering sites in California. So some sort of more generalized how to approach habitat management restoration at a monarch overwintering site in California. Um, <clears throat> and then lastly, we conducted an analysis of the federal, state, and local laws and regulations that might be available to protect monarchs and monarch habitat. And that's a, a resource that's available on our website as well. And that was done in partnership with Lewis and Clark Law School a few years ago. Okay, I'll switch back to Samantha. So we'll wrap up the talk here with opportunities for conservation and then some resources and tools. And so the Western Monarch and Milkweed Habitat Suitability Assessment that Serena just went into some detail about, that is going to take as many people as possible contributing to the data, to collecting the data in order to make the model really meaningful so we can get an idea of what's happening across the Western US for monarchs, where the breeding areas are. Um, and so there is fresh on the street, actually, the Monarch SOS application for iPhones. It's free. Um, it interfaces with this habitat suitability assessment and you can go into that application and it actually has a lot of great information for just educational purposes, but then you also can go within the Xerces tab in the application and it will link to uh, little miniature spreadsheets where you can enter information in the field and then that information will be uploaded and shared as part of this study. So it's making it, it's just another way that you could contribute, even if it's opportunistic versus some kind of organized survey. Every, every bit will help. And Serena also um, provided the link for the Xerces Society, because that's another way if you want to go in through their website and, and fill out a, a spreadsheet there. And so also, if anyone does want to survey lands for milkweed where they've just noted that there are milkweed locations or breeding monarch locations, that would be super helpful. But if you don't have the capacity to do it and want to try to get some help, then you could contact either one of us and we can try to see what we can do there. Locating and protecting the breeding areas, very important, the migration corridors and protecting the overwintering sites very important. Also the Thanksgiving count in some areas, and that's something that Serena also just talked about and it's organized by the Xerces Society. And so that Thanksgiving count has really given us the best idea of uh, that we have out here as far as what's happening with the Western monarchs and the actual uh, 
numbers that are overwintering on the California coast. So if there's anybody that's wanting to participate in that or help to volunteer to collect that information, that would be great. The Mares for Monarch pledge, which Fish and Wildlife Service um, is supportive of and National Wildlife Federation, I believe, is a sponsor of, that is uh, cities and municipalities across the United States where mayors are signing on saying they want to do positive things for monarchs. And then there is lists of resources in order to determine what the best actions would be for any given community, including outreach and education events. And then also if there is a possibility to streamline the permitting process for priority actions for monarchs, um, that would be very helpful through CDFW. Um, for tagging, which is again, something where we need more information about the movement of monarchs across the landscape, or for OE sampling to get a better idea on disease impacts, and then other for other research purposes. And then we also are wanting to develop a team or a consortium across the Western US where we take a landscape scale approach to monarch conservation. And so this next slide is just an idea, a schematic of what that could look like, where we have all, all the folks that are already involved in monarch research or monarch habitat restoration or outreach and education come to the table, um, can help contribute to the habitat suitability assessment, the model, help to address the data gaps that we've been talking about, ultimately develop a landscape level plan for monarchs in the West, and then implement conservation actions that are identified as priorities, and then monitor those actions for effectiveness. And so that's what we're hoping happens in the long run to get everybody coordinating with one another and sharing information. So I'll hand it back to Serena to wrap things up. A few ideas of some opportunities for monarch conservation in California. I just wanted to display what we know about where monarchs are breeding in California on this map. And I put a um, layer of CDFW managed land since those are easily publicly available. Um, but I know there are probably a lot, a lot of other folks on the webinar from other agencies um, as well. And <clears throat> I think really in California, breeding happens um, in many areas of the state and probably in other areas that we just haven't yet documented. Um, milkweed is really dispersed in, it looks like every county of the, the state with, with the exception of, I don't think there's any records in Delnor Nort County up there. Um, but I think there are a lot of opportunities to conserve breeding habitat uh, for monarchs within the state of California, especially on, on publicly managed lands. Um, more than half of our known overwintering sites are publicly managed. So California Department of Fish and Wildlife, we know manages five overwintering sites um, fully. California Parks and Recreation is our largest overwintering site manager. They manage 47 of our overwintering sites, including a number of the sites that have come out as the highest priority sites for um, restoration and active management. Department of Defense, again, is a, a huge site manager with some of their um, with Vandenberg Air Force Base, for example, on the, the coast, they manage 37 sites. National Park Service is a large manager with 11. The UC system manages 11. And then we've got local governments, um, cities and, and um, counties managing 95 sites in total. And then there's a number of other sites that have like a mixed public-private ownership and aren't really, really captured here. But there are a lot of opportunities for um, agencies to actively engage in um, restoration of overwintering sites. Um, and then I think there are opportunities for local governments as well as the Coastal Commission um, to actually provide greater protection for overwintering sites. We haven't really talked about this that much, but um, overwintering sites are frequently dominated by eucalyptus, um, which is not planted anymore, right? It's this exotic invasive species. Uh, and the eucalyptus are really becoming decadent and, and aging at a lot of these overwintering sites and are starting to pose public safety hazards and, um, and die. And they're not being replanted, which is fine. The Xerces Society is not recommending, recommending replanting them, but um, the structure of a lot of these overwintering sites is, um, I think, 
changing a lot, and, and many of them are probably becoming less suitable for hosting monarchs. And, you know, we don't really know to what extent that's affecting the overall population, but it's reasonable to assume that it's having some effect. Um, so many of these overwintering sites are not actively, are not necessarily actively managed and are not really protected either. Um, I know just from personal experience, having been having worked on monarchs for many years, that a lot of sites have been developed just at my just in the last few years have you know housing developments have gone in or maybe the maybe trees around sites have come down to make way for housing developments, um, and that changes the microclimate of the site. So. Um, you know, monarchs are really choosing the same areas along the California coast that a lot of people like to live, and so there's a, a bit of a conflict there. But many of our overwintering sites fall within the coastal zone, this area that's approximately six miles in from the Pacific coastline. And some local governments um, have designated monarch overwintering sites in their local coastal plans as environmentally sensitive habitat areas, but very few have. So sites that are designated as, as ESHAs, environmentally sensitive habitat areas, um, do have protection from development and in some cases um, provide for some more active management. So, so that's one option for um, local governments uh, who might wish to, to provide greater protection for their overwintering sites. Um, and with that, there's, we have a whole set of resources and tools. Um, did you want to go through that, Samantha? Or? Sure. Okay. I can, I wanted to <laughs> and then I think add it's something. go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I won't I won't walk through every one of these, um, but Xerxes Society is a great resource, and there's a couple different links there. The Fish and Wildlife Service, just the general Save the Monarch link that's provided there, um, can show you just the approach of the Fish and Wildlife Service to monarch conservation. But then the Refuges Friends Monarchs link provides a lot of information. And it's updated regularly as far as outreach and education type things that people can use. And, but then there are these other sites that we listed here as well. And, and I also just wanted to point out that for the Fish and Wildlife Service, there's a few different programs that are really actively involved in particular with habitat restoration. And so those specific programs could be valuable resources. Those being the Partners for Fish and Wildlife program and that program is focused on doing habitat restoration on private lands. That would be non-federal, non-state lands. And then there's the coastal program that's focused in priority coastal areas around the United States. And, and for California, we have become involved in some of the overwintering site work that Serena mentioned. And then there's also the schoolyard habitat program that I mentioned previously as well, where there's a lot of really knowledgeable people in that program, particularly across, um, at least for the areas that I know across California and Nevada, but also in other parts of the U.S. And so they're actively working on pollinator projects and monarch-specific projects as well. And so through those programs, there is some funding that can be available as well as just consultation for technical assistance when you're wanting to do something proactive for pollinators or monarchs. And so then this last slide is acknowledgments from both Xerces and Fish and Wildlife Service.